Eric, would you like to add anything? Um, Barrett Myers, just uh, sorry I didn't make the last meeting. I was actually in Alaska at the National uh, Tribal Transportation Conference that we had there. So time time difference was a little hard to get on the <laughs> on the call there. Um, so in Indian Country, we have a we have a lot of different issues because of of the makeup of where reservations and things so we do have some urban reservations um, located you know whether you're in the Seattle area uh, Los Angeles area San Diego some of those areas um, and they already have a little bit of a different approach with with the EV um, a lot of our issues stem from actually being able to build a grid out to support um, electric vehicles and having charging stations and, and things of that nature because the remoteness of some of these areas there's there's not even power that you can build one or build these two um, another thing is just getting that information and the education out there um, is, is a, it's a little bit of a roadblock and I think that goes for rural America as well, not just Indian country as a whole, is the, um, getting the education out about electric vehicles and about all these alternative ways of, of providing vehicles for certain things. Uh, my tribe, for instance, we, we have, I think, two now electric buses. We're the first in the state of North Carolina to actually have electric buses. and. Um, it's trying to get folks to see that yes, you, you can have electric vehicles in a bus or maybe even heavy equipment or or larger trucks and vehicles. It's not just you know driving around the little Volkswagen or the Prius type of thing. Um, but We are in need to, in Indian country, of the technical assistance to, to help go get the funding. So we, there's, we understand there's a lot of funding out there. Some of, the, some of it we don't, a lot of us don't qualify for because we weren't designated along alternative fuel corridors because we weren't at the table with the states when they designated us. But. The other portion is, is is having the expertise to go after that funding, right? To know how do you put together a good proposal, a proposal and things of that nature to, to get that funding. And some of the barriers that, that hinder tribes from actually being able to receive the funding that could help you know, build out their their fleet or build out their grid so that they can support electric vehicles. And so those are things that are a lot of our priority right now is, is figuring out the ways that we can get the funding but also ways that we can be at the table so that we're not left out of funding because we, we don't qualify because we weren't on a designated route or things of that nature as well. Thank you. And Crystal, would you like to add any comments? Sure. Hi, Crystal Phil Cox, um, Travel Transportation and Logistics at, at GSA. So um, I actually have all things planes, trains, automobiles, and hotels. <laughs> um, so, uh, but we do have um, GSA fleet. It, we are the required source of supply for the federal government's fleet. We lease about 220,000 vehicles, um, all types of vehicles. It's really a working fleet. So um, set about 70% light duty, but a lot of you know trucks and passenger vans. Um, we ha have started deploying um, vehicles uh, throughout the fleet. We've got um, all the EV buses that are going through the national parks right now. Uh, we've got, um, I think DOT and DOE are definitely our biggest customers for EVs. So uh, that's fantastic. Um, and, uh, and and we uh, work closely on uh, fleet policy for government. We also have all the buildings, so we have an interesting, all the federal buildings, so we have an interesting intersection of um, 
of uh, you know, in the installation of EV charging stations all over the country in federal buildings. And we are starting with uh, those buildings where federal employees are working, and then uh, probably the next phase would be moving out to things like federal courthouses and other um, GSA managed buildings. But um, that's uh, we're 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 doing a lot with uh, the manufacturers right now. We're also doing a lot with some utility companies uh, as we start to install charging stations in, in federal buildings across the country. Great. Well, thank you to our uh, four members who weren't able to join us last time. Um, and welcome again, everyone. Now to um, the more exciting part. Just going to cover some ground rules for how a remainder of today will work for our Q&A period. Um, so for our members who are here, uh, when we get to the Q&A portions of each um, uh, session, we ask that you just turn your table tent vertically, and Gabe or Rachel will call on you at that time. For our members who are joining us virtually, we ask that you raise your hand, and we'll be looking at Zoom, and uh, we'll try to call on you as appropriate as well. Um, for those from the public joining us today, you are muted, but you can chat with the host if, you're, uh, if you have technical issues or need help. But during the public comment period tomorrow, that's when we'll provide a little more information on how you can participate um, and provide remarks. So for our next session, we're going to be hearing from our leadership and then have time for discussion. When we open it up, as a reminder, you can turn your table tent and please keep your questions to one or two minutes so that we can be sure to hear from as many people as possible. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Gabe. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we've got both secretaries, I believe, here outside. We're very excited to have them. And I'll just say, um, I'll, I'll be very brief. But um, without them, we wouldn't have a, a joint office. We wouldn't be breaking down these silos between energy and transportation. They're like my personal heroes, as well as our bosses. Um, and I, I will also just say that um, you know, this EV working group, we take it very seriously. A ton of planning went into this. It is not window dressing. We really want and need your input and your feedback. And we all take it very seriously. And in the charter, it specifies that these are our co-chairs, and we are making recommendations to the secretaries, um, and obviously to us as well. Uh, but so please take that charge seriously. They do. Um, we're really glad that you're here, and of course, we're honored uh, to have them join us in person uh, for about 45 minutes. So with that, shall we invite them in? Good to match. Um, five more minutes. All right. Who wants to see me break dance? Really? I was going to break dance at the Christmas party, but uh, I was the, looking for you. the lawyers wouldn't let me come. <laughs> yeah. um, but you've got the tie up, man. It's a good look. I do have a tie. Yeah, for those of you that don't know me, this may be. <laughs> you see me the tie. Usually I look like uh, like Charles. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, that case. <laughs> oh, and uh, okay, if, if I do have to do a little dance, I, I will say that quite a bit of time <coughs> went into every single one of you uh, that's here. Um, and it was really as much about the people and their personal sort of interest and opinions as it was maybe about your organization. And so, you know, know that. And uh, we really do want to hear from you, so don't be shy. I wish I could be here tomorrow, but it turns out there's a ribbon cutting for the first Nebby station tomorrow. Um, so I, I will be going to that. Otherwise, I was really excited to actually do the workshopping with you all, but I'll be here all day today. Where's the first Nebby station? Ohio. Is it, yeah, it's in Ohio. It's so in Ohio. It's announced on yeah. Friday. Um, and we're doing the ribbon cutting <laughs> ceremony tomorrow. Yeah. And then we'll probably do another one, another stand on Friday. So they're starting to really roll in. Yeah. Um, I just came actually from the National Governors Association meeting. We had all 52 states and jurisdictions there. There's a ton of excitement to get this done. And I had states coming up to me afterwards saying, hey, we're going to be mid-January. We're going to be February. Can you send somebody out there? And I was like, ooh, it's too cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. I thought Hawaii was the first one. Well, that's, that's what we're hoping, but it uh, looks like Maine is in the mix in January. <laughs> but I know that Michael Berryby, who's remote, 
uh, and from Maine will be very excited to represent us. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe this is a good opportunity to, to just do a quick reminder, because we want to hear from all of you. Um, please keep remarks to one or two minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, and we will, we will relentlessly enforce that <laughs> on our side um, so that we're just, you know, continuing the conversation, just making sure that everybody is, is heard, including uh, the great leadership that we have here. Yeah, and um, so just to run through it again, so we're going to allow the principals here, and we're going to have Chair Mallory, uh, we're going to have Postmaster DeJoy and Administrator Carnahan here as well. So they'll be asking questions. Most of this is because uh, Dr. Neeliger wanted to see if I could keep up. But you know, <laughs> I think my moderating skills were good to do the reverse uh, questioning. <laughs> but um, when we ask these questions, yeah, just go like this if you want to answer it. Right? And if you don't answer anything the entire time, Dr. Neeliger will call on you. <laughs> Any questions on that? I did my dance. Great. Just give it a minute. We are ahead of schedule. Just as a, a side note, are those nebula locations commissioned? Or what's the ribbon cutting for? Just oh, yeah. to know no electricity? Electrified yep. operational. Nice. Plug in a car. I see Andrew Rogers over yeah. there. Excellent. The administrator, we're going to go tomorrow uh, to Ohio. And then there's another unnamed state. And there will hopefully be a third one this month. We'll see. I talked to them too. Right. Yeah. Yep. We are tracking closely, uh, That's great. making sure that we are effectively amplifying that. Yeah. That would be great. We also reminded the states in the NGA meeting this morning that as soon as they reach fully built out, they can start flexing their funding and build other chargers, other you know, charging where they want it. And it was interesting. The uh, it was the the infrastructure coordinators mostly. But a lot of their faces lit up. Like, I think people just forget. Um, so some of this stuff's really important. We probably need a couple billion dollars to build out to the minimum standards. And then that's going to leave about two and a half billion uh, that they can flex. Yeah. Uh, why don't we have come to now? We're going to have them. We're going to introduce them. We've got the secretary. Oh, I didn't know. Where are they? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. So welcome. Secretary Buttigieg is the Secretary Greyhawk. Office breaking down silos between energy and transportation and getting all this great feedback from you all. So we're very serious about it, and I appreciate that. And uh, all these folks, and we have people from the tribes, we have people representing equitable communities, we have MPO, we've got uh, energy regulators, the trucking industry, you name it, we have it. And um, they really are reporting, you know, through us, but to you. And the charge is uh, for them to educate us and for us to hear from them. And that's how we structured it today, about what's important to, to you all as we uh, build this reliable, equitable national network. And so we want to give um, both secretaries an opportunity to speak for a few minutes and sort of give us your charge, starting with Secretary Buttigieg and then we'll our other esteemed I guess as well after you talk. Great. Well, uh, uh, thanks, Gabe. Welcome to the DOT. We're really proud to, to be hosting you and, and proud to be partnering with the Department of Energy, with Secretary Granholm, and all of our uh, partners from across the, the federal government and across the, the country on this. And we're especially glad that you're lending your time and, and your talents to this. Uh, EVs remain a, a hot topic, especially with regard to the decarbonization of transportation, where there are some modes, and this was uh, certainly being discussed at, at the COP talks, like aviation, uh, like uh, maritime modes, where uh, you know if we work at warp speed on aviation, by the 2050s, there could be forms of propulsion that are completely different. Meanwhile, 
on surface transportation, there are technologies that are commercially available in people's homes today uh, that are zero emission and much depends on how quickly their adoption accelerates because transportation is the sector of the U.S. economy generating the most carbon pollution. And so to me, that means we should take it as our charge to be the biggest part of the solution, and EVs are at the absolute heart of that. Uh, on one hand, as I uh, find myself trying to remind the, the public and Congress, uh, I think there's no going back. Uh, you know, as, as the son of the industrial Midwest who uh, lived in a downtown that was haunted by an auto factory that went quiet in 1963, I know the cost of failing to keep up, failing to innovate, and so does our industry. And so I don't think there's any question of the automotive industry uh, going back. EVs are clearly the future with or without us. This sometimes raises the question of why we bother to have an EV policy. But what won't happen with or without us are three incredibly important questions. Will it happen quickly enough to help us meet the climate challenge? Will it happen in equitable terms, where the savings and benefits of EV ownership and, and use are felt by those who most need it, including uh, low-income urban populations, rural and tribal Americans? Uh, and third, uh, will it be a made-in-America EV revolution, which is incredibly important to all of us and certainly to the President? The answer to all of those can be yes, if we do this right. And that's why we're working so hard uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, not only supercharge the, the, the adoption of the production of EVs, uh, but make them more affordable to purchase and easier to own, including by deploying EV chargers around the country. Uh, I'm pleased to report, uh, as of I think uh, uh, today or as of this week, the first NEVI funded EV charger uh, went into service in Ohio. That is the first of thousands and thousands to come, uh, and that's a uh, big part of what's going to get us uh, on the way to the president's 500,000 charger code by the end of the decade. Uh, we also know that this is something that is new in kind and challenging and uh, will present all kinds of needs for us to stay closely aligned with our stakeholder community to get this right. Uh, so whether we're talking about the uh, chargers or any of the other elements of EV production and adoption, uh, this is going to require uh, all of the expertise from every sector of American society. And that's what you were bringing and why we're so proud to have you today and, and so thankful that you're lending your time for that. Uh, so with that, uh, I have the honor of turning it over to Secretary Granholm. As I do, I just want to remark uh, on the extraordinary insight uh, and energy that she has brought uh, to, to the leadership of this effort. And uh, you know, for my time, this joint office is one of the most remarkable interagency things happening uh, in, in the administration and uh, wouldn't be happening without your leadership. So, uh, so, so thrilled to hear the helmet Great. energy and welcome to DOT. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Secretary Buttigieg. We feel the uh, same way. I know there's a great amount of hybrid vigor associated with the two, the combining of the two offices and the great incredible staff that he brings, the incredible staff that DOE brings. And uh, thank you so much, Gabe, Rachel, uh, and the incredible work of the, of the office to date. I'm so glad that we have our other uh, partners up here and other arms and branches of the federal government to make sure that we do this right. Uh, from users, thank you so much for the commitment uh, of that and uh, all we're doing it. I know you, you'll probably say a word about uh, this, about our fleet, etc. But, um, you know, the, the inexorable movement of this adoption of EVs is, is so, uh, you know, thrilling. So yes, a million EVs sold this year. I'm sure where that. I mean, if just to put this into context, in 2000, in the year 2000, one in 25 vehicles was an EV, and today it's one in five, and that's only going to, uh, you know, continue to improve, and it'll continue to improve based upon how we do our work here in this in this group. So, I think it's a thousand chargers per <coughs> are are being installed. I think what do we have, 165,000 at this moment? Actually, 166 as of this morning. 166,000 as of this morning, which is great. And the goal for us at our, and our charge is 500,000 and distributed in an equitable way, as you were saying. Thanks so much for, for that. So, um, you know, we're, we've been working, trying to work on both the supply side and the demand side of the EV strategy, right? It's kind of doing everything everywhere all at once. And you're well aware, I'm sure, that the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits the $7,500 for the purchase of an EV, very important. $4,000 for the purchase of a used EV, uh, very important uh, for larger 
trucks, et cetera, 40, up to $40,000 uh, of a tax credit. Those are all really important strategies to increase uh, demand on the supply side, making sure that we're building them, and we're building them in America. So for those of you who come from the EV manufacturing side of things, thank you so much. For those of you who represent uh, the battery side of things, thank you so much. We've got, I think, $150 billion worth of investment since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law in communities all across the country. And to your point, uh, Secretary Buttigieg, you know, I mean, when you come from places where you have seen the hollowing out of communities, uh, right, John? The fact that you've got reverse flow of manufacturing in the United States is like, oh, it's amazing. And But all of that is in service to getting these cars out, and the cars are not going to get out unless we do our job, uh, our job here. So um, thank you for your willingness to serve in this regard. Um, uh, so you mentioned Ohio. I think we're expecting ri ribbon cuttings in New York, in Maine, in Vermont, and Pennsylvania all very soon. Uh, 27 states have issued competitive solicitations. I think you maybe I've gone over this. And 11 more have issued conditional awards. We just got to get them out to all 50 states uh, and territories. Um, you know, it's it's uh, we've got we've got some work to do. So next steps. Um, we're interested in where uh, the transition to electric is coming in the hardest to go places like uh, heavy duty and medium heavy and medium and heavy duty vehicles. We know there's more work to do. We know the battery sizes have to increase. We know that there's an impact on the grid uh, when you're pulling that much power down. So all of those charges, the, the grid piece, um, is really important. Uh, we've, we know that electrification, we've already got a huge increase in demand projected on the grid. As we electrify everything, it's only going to be more. Therefore, uh, we have work to do in making sure that we've got transmission. Uh, and so we're working on that piece. There's a $10 billion series of grants that we are putting out to uh, upgrade the nation's electric grid to be able to take on all this extra uh, power suck. Uh, we are deploying, deploying, deploying clean energy as much as possible because you do not want clean vehicles powered by dirty energy. And so the fact that um, we have built out this year so far just on solar, so the Hoover Dam is 2 gigawatts of power. We've built out 15 Hoover Dams this year in the United States just on solar. Amazing. So we're doing all of that, all of that because we need to electrify everything. <laughs> So thrilled that um, you guys will be helping us to answer some of these really hard questions and providing recommendations and making sure we've got the right metrics and we're asking the right questions. So um, we consider this whole clean energy transition to be uh, private sector led, government enabled. And so that partnership between public and private is incredibly important for the success of this. Um, so with that, do I love it back to you, Gabe? Yes. All right. Thank Great. You thank you, so you much. all so much. Yeah. No, thanks to both of you for the inspirational uh, comments. And I just want to emphasize, I think what you heard is that we can design this and build it in a win-win-win fashion, right? And that's absolutely key. I think that's what this administration is all about. It's got to be a win-win-win for everybody. And that's why all of you are here. Our job is to operationalize that with EOT and DOE teams and then getting your input on how we do it in such a way so that nobody is left behind and that industry and everybody's concerns are taken <coughs> are absolutely important. So that's going to help us frame the next um, day and a half, but also the next 40 minutes where we're going to have a discussion. Uh, and it's going to involve three other esteemed guests. And I'd love to give you a minute each or so to introduce yourself. So administrator, uh, shall we start with? Uh, Brenda Mallory. Welcome, Chair Brenda Mallory. Yes. <laughs> Chair Brenda Mallory, excuse me. Yes, that's fine. Um, and you can introduce yourself and then we'll move down. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really a thrill to be here. My name is Brenda Mallory. I'm the Chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And we obviously work in great partnership with all of these folks in advancing our sustainability efforts across government and um, very much ensuring that the work that we're doing uh, collectively with, with all of you also is done in ways that uh, is equitable very big theme of ours. So I'm grateful to have a chance to be here. Um, you know, the, the president charged the, the federal agencies through the federal sustainability plan with acquiring 100% 
um, of zero, zero emission vehicles for all light duty vehicles by 2027. And, and we are on track, and I'm proud to, to say that we are on track. Um, with the actions of the Biden-Harris administration um, putting forth uh, on, on this work and saving taxpayer dollars and supporting climate action and creating uh, thousands of jobs, um, we're delivering kind of cleaner, uh, we're cleaner communities uh, for all, and that's a really important part of the, the work that we're trying to advance. And you all are such key uh, uh, parts of the work that we're doing because we know it has to be done in partnership. We know that it has to be done in ways that will work on the ground. And I think that groups like this and the efforts that you, uh, uh, contributions that you make are really important for us to be able to achieve that. So with that, I say thank you. I um, look forward to the discussion over the next hour. And, okay, and not Chair Robin Carnahan, Administrator <laughs> Robin Carnahan, uh, can you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Robin Carnahan. I run the General Services Administration, and the reason that we're here today is because we have a big fleet of vehicles, like uh, our postmaster, uh, and so we are transitioning that fleet to EVs. Uh, we've made great progress in 2001. One percent of that fleet, of about a quarter of million vehicles, uh, was uh, electric, as that and this year it's 18%. So we're making great progress in just a couple of years, and we continue to we plan to continue to do that. We're also very focused on innovative technologies. Um, we have a thing called the Green Proving Ground. If you all don't know about that in the private sector, you should. You should look it up. Uh, it's a way that we can invest in companies that are doing things that create efficiency. Uh, we have a big cohort that's going to be coming in. Many of those are focused on uh, EV and uh, charging infrastructure space. Um, Obviously, we are trying to use the government's buying power uh, to, to try to make markets in this, and I think that uh, we, we've proven to be able to, to do that successfully. The other role that GSA has in trying to accelerate all of this is through a, a program called FedRAMP. I don't know if anybody's heard of that in this room, but it is basically the security protocols that anything that is connected to the cloud has to go through to be able to be put uh, in, into sort of connection with federal buildings and federal facilities. So uh, that, that's our role here. I will say in terms of acceleration and what we hope to learn from you all is really how we can put the pedal down. What do we need to do? Is it standardization? How do we standardize uh, infrastructure? How do we standardize payment protocols? How do we standardize grid integration. Those are the kinds of things that we can help with uh, that can help you all accelerate this whole transition. So very happy to be here. Great. Thank you so much. And um, Postmaster General Lewis Joy. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm proud to represent the 650,000 men and women of the United States Postal Service. Uh, we have a workforce that is self, you know, a self-financed organization. And we have give you a little bit of idea of the scale that we're deploying under right now: thirty-one thousand retail centers and nineteen thousand delivery units across the nation, four hundred processing centers, and out of these locations, we load fifty thousand trucks a day. I load two hundred planes a day, and, and load two hundred and fifty thousand carrier vehicles each day to deliver several hundred million pieces of mail and packages to 165 million locations across the nation. So think about that. I'll let you absorb that for a minute. That's the size and scale of the uh, organization. Over the last three years, we have been working to align our service improvements, our sales growth, our network improvements, our network modernization, our cost reduction initiatives, because we've been losing billions of dollars for many years. Uh, 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 to uh, align all these initiatives to the reduction of our carbon emissions because it's it's there for every dollar I spend less I burn less carbon and that's the unique thing about our initiative uh, here it is uh, you know how much we can align and measure uh, you know everything that we're, we're doing uh, we're excited about what we're going to do in the future I want to thank the chair Brenda Mallory and her team Andrew Mayock and Mark Dowd along with uh, senior White House advisor uh, John Podesta who worked with us, uh, and they've really tried to get an understanding of our organization, where we are in the, you know the, the, in terms of our condition right now, and what we have to do going long forward, going forward to serve the American public, to save money, and to uh, you know align with the president's uh, goals and your all goals for the uh, uh, for climate you know for you know for reduction, which has become our, our goals right now, and. Uh, 
and, and, and so uh, uh, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks to all five of you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, it means a lot to us. It's going to be extremely helpful. I want to point to the Secretary's charge that uh, we've put together. I'm not going to read it out loud, but there's basically two elements that we want to focus collectively across government, industry, NGO, um, uh, tribes. We want to get all of this input and want everybody to try to come together and look out for each other's best interests as well and to sort of learn and understand what those challenges and opportunities are. And then the other part is to develop goals, metrics, and actionable recommendations uh, for industry and government. Um, and hopefully we can work collectively to implement those. Um, so with that, um, this is a little unconventional, but again, I blame that on Dr. Neeler. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's really, it's in the spirit of the EV Working Group that we want to hear from you versus the government talking at you. And so we set this up a little bit differently um, so that leadership has come, they thought about you know, challenges and opportunities and develop questions and they will ask you and when you want to answer, you can turn your, whatever this thing's called, table, uh, tent. table tent on its side <laughs> um, and then I will call on you. Does that all make sense? Um, I'll start with the with an easy question. Um, what do you see as I'm not going to answer it myself. What do you see as the single biggest barrier to EV adoption today? Cost, access, infrastructure, the <coughs> biggest challenge. Bear. Well, speaking for for a lot of the tribal nations, ours is infrastructure. That's that's the biggest thing. Um, having having. The ability to build out a sustainable community that can support electric vehicles. Um, because, of, again, a lot of our uh, reservations are in very remote areas, and a lot of the infrastructure is not built out already. So, we, we still have several homes that aren't electrified, let alone wondering how we're going to establish an infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, that that's a that is a that's a big thing, and then of course just the education and technical assistance side of that is to to allow for us to get mechanisms in place so that we can build that grid out, and then also support that grid. So there's <coughs> twofold, right? I mean, the, you know, it's, you feel the dreams, you can build it, and they'll come. But then, what do we do whenever we have to maintain this thing? Right? We don't have anybody certified to to work on EV stations. A lot, of, and so those are the areas that that we're we're looking at is funding for 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 the infrastructure, but also funding to build up the the technical assistance and the expertise so that we can put our people to work maintaining the grid once we get Great. Thank you for that. Very helpful. And I think, Nadia, were you next? Sure. Thank you. An honor to be here today um, representing the utility industry, all types of utilities. Uh, I would say, really, it's all three, you know, access, cost, slash affordability, and infrastructures, as you all said. Uh, it's also different in different areas and different jurisdictions, right? So the cost structures can, can vary um, depending on where you are and what, you know, an access in the state of the health of the grid uh, varies. But I think uh, what I would say is as we take a big step back with this collective group, it's really uh, essential that we look at the electrification of transportation is one key piece as we electrify everything, as you said. So thinking about how we uh, keep the generation carbon free, um, the transmission, but also the distribution system. That is the fundamental backbone of, of being able to have uh, the build out that we need. And, and I'll just close with saying too, the grid of today, we need to think differently for the future because um, we're going to have, you know, battery storage. The EVs we joke internally, it's like a it is a battery on wheels, so it's a form of transportation and a battery. So thinking about storage and how these come together, uh, and I will end there. Great, uh, John Bazell. Uh, thanks, Gabe. Uh, and I, I just want to start by thanking uh, the secretaries and, and all of you, uh, government officials. This conversation is critical. There's just no question about it. 
getting not only the all of government approach act in, you know, acted on in this format, but bringing private sector and other interests together, absolutely critical. Uh, there is a sense of urgency that I feel in this room right now, and from an auto industry perspective, it's welcome. We've invested $125 billion over the last five years in this transformation. We are out there committed to an electric future, and the future, uh, as you said, Secretary, Secretary Buttigieg is going to be electric. What are the barriers? If you look at it from the customer and work back, clearly the availability of infrastructure, reliable, affordable, accessible infrastructure. Here's the way you've got to think about EVs. It has to be no compromise mobility. There can't be any compromises. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be available, reliable, affordable, accessible. We can get into all of that. I think that's what tomorrow is going to be about, but that's first and foremost. I want to come back to this idea of making them here. When you think about that, clearly the biggest barrier is supply chain. The availability of critical minerals, raw materials, and components to support American manufacturing comes to the forefront when you think about, as you said, Secretary Granholm, the supply side. And then finally, coming back to the consumer, this has to be affordable. So the availability of infrastructure and supportive supply chains creates the opportunity for affordability. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Dave, thank you. Um, again, I appreciate everyone uh, for uh, joining or having us here today. But uh, so, yeah, I think the biggest uh, concern, I represent the UAW and, and, and labor movement, and I, I know one of our biggest issues right now are, are folks that would, I represent the UAW struggle to even purchase our own current vehicles right now, ICE vehicles, which are obviously priced a lot less than you know, an EV vehicle. So, so cost is the biggest factor um, that uh, I, I, you know, I see as an issue. And, and beyond that is, uh, you know, obviously the infrastructure and, and uh, uh, charging network, uh, obviously having consumer um, belief that if they do purchase an EV vehicle, that EV charging stations are readily available and, and accessible wherever they may be. So that's where I see it. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Doug? Yeah, one, one issue I want to raise that I think um, Barack mentioned earlier is uh, education knowledge. You know, we're in this room, all of us are uh, to one degree or another experts when it comes to EVs, relatively speaking. But of, uh, of the 300 million folks out there, uh, a good portion of which are going to be motorists or are already motorists, uh, they need to know a lot more about EVs. And they need to know a lot more about charging or infrastructure. We could talk a lot about affordability of the vehicles, affordability and um, uh, competence with respect to being able to get those vehicles charged, but I think they need to learn a lot more about EVs. We take a lot for granted. If it were up to me, I'd like to see the government focus some attention on a nationwide campaign of public education. When they come to our dealers, they're going to get specific education on the vehicles and how to charge them. But it's getting them to the dealerships that I think the government can do a lot more on. Could we just unpack that for a second? What are the two or three things people prove to be most surprised about? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll give all volunteer one that, that I've noticed is many people have no idea that an ordinary wall plug is, mm -hmm. in some cases, all mm -hmm. the charging infrastructure you need. Uh, but what are two or three factual things that you just think people don't know? And you well, find range in? is one. Um, you know, every customer is different. There's a million vehicles that are sold each year to fleet customers, so let's put them aside. After the fleet customers, you've got your households, your working families, and each one of those families has a different duty cycle, if you will, for the vehicles that they're currently operating or will be operating in the future. And so you ha it's each of those vehicles gets sold one at a time, and many of these EVs can work very well for those households, and it's dispelling some of the myths regarding range, regarding the availability of charging, and knowing that, that for many, many folks they could charge at home or they can charge nearby <coughs> is, uh, is one of the many myths that can be dispelled. Also, yes, they are cost, they cost more <coughs> than our uh, fossil fuel vehicles, but at the same time, there is money out there. 
we all know about the infrastructure uh, and, the, and money that's out there, but we also, uh, I think many of the consumers out there have no idea of the tax credits at the federal level, the tax credits at the state level, and the tax credit in many cases from the utilities or the, the assistance, the financial assistance from the utilities that can make these vehicles affordable. Thank you for that. Uh, Rakesh? Thank you, Gabe. Thank you to the secretaries for providing us this uh, forum to have this critical conversation. I'm Rakesh Aneja. I'm representing our commercial vehicle industry, medium and heavy duty vehicles. And as we can all appreciate, tremendous opportunity for decarbonization, representing 7% of the anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions that are produced. And just wanted to emphasize the unique needs of the commercial vehicle industry. It's a B2B uh, industry, as we know. And we often talk of three factors that are required for decarbonization or the transformation to be successful. And we talk of those three factors as parts of a multiplication equation to drive home the point that each one of them is required to be successful. If any one of them is zero or unsuccessful, like in a multiplication equation, the net result will be zero. Vehicle products and technology being the first one, infrastructure being the second one, and cost of ownership being the third one. As far as the first part is concerned, I think we have initial vehicles available from several of our OEMs today uh, that are excellent fit for several use cases, drainage, regional hall, food, beverage distribution. Um, and certainly, there's a lot more to be done. I'm not suggesting our work is done. We are only getting started. But these, app, these vehicles can do the job. And driver feedback and customer feedback is exceptional. Where we are challenged today is infrastructure. The production vehicles are in production. If you order one today, we can have it delivered in three to four months. Infrastructure timelines are easily measured in years compared to months on the vehicle ordered and delivery side. And last but certainly not the least, uh, cost of ownership. It is a B2B business and customers are looking to make money. No one's buying a second truck for their spouse or college going kid. It's really a business tool. And today these vehicles are two to three times, best case, more expensive than their diesel counterparts. And uh, last comment I'll make is, um, this goes back to your comment as well, will this, will this revolution be made in America led? And that's one way to bring costs down. Localizing and industrializing battery cells and batteries in the United States and scaling up the production will help on the cost side. So it's really infrastructure and cost, the two biggest bottlenecks today. Thank you. Now I know we have four more questions, actually like five with somebody online. And then we want to get uh, allow the secretaries and, and our other guests to ask some questions. Can people keep their uh, answer to 30? Seconds. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. <laughs> You're on. Time are gone. Uh, Charles T. Brown with Equitable Cities. Thank you so much for your <coughs> tremendous leadership. Um, I'll say one word. That word is fear. Um, and it's fear because there's a ton of misinformation and disinformation, which is leading people to think that there's a threat on their um, personal choices and liberties. So I think what we need to do simply is debunk and dispel the myths associated with. Um, electric vehicles. Thank you. As to what Doug was saying. Cassie. Thank you for having us and for your leadership. I'm Cassie Powers with NASIO. I represent the state energy offices across the states and territories. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will echo that consumer awareness is perhaps the greatest barrier to adoption right now, but one of the key antidotes to that is infrastructure investment. And so the NEVI program, the Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Grants, will go a long ways towards that, but broadening that, making sure that the grid infrastructure is <coughs> available, up to date, and can service this incredible increase in load that we're expecting is needed. And next to that then is making sure that there is a policy framework in place to provide market certainty to industry and to actors to make sure that they have the investment needs met. There, thank you, Danielle. Sure, Danielle Sasperinet with the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. So appropriate that I'm sitting here, thank you all. Um, and building from that, on the grid infrastructure side, affordability is the biggest challenge that we're gonna face. And not just affordability about how much it's going to cost to build the grid infrastructure, but what's the impact going to be on low-income customers and low- and moderate-income ratepayers? And how much are we going to ask ratepayers to absorb the lumpiness 
that we're going to be needing to invest in order to get to the point where this makes sense in a traditional utility structure. But uh, that getting over that lumpiness from uh, an affordability and equity perspective is a really big barrier. We're going to do it. Uh, we've got Dean, and then we've got is it Henrik? Henrik. Henrik. Online. Online. So go ahead, Dean. Thank you very much for uh, hosting us. This is great. Um, Dean Bushy, represent private industry. So the charging infrastructure, the truck stops, the travel centers of America. So CapEx is just one cost. OpEx is really what we're looking at. How are we going to make a profit down the road? We, we support sustainability. So we don't know what the utilization is going to be. We don't know what the timeline for permitting is going to be. We're uncertain of when the ramp up is going to be, especially in the medium duty, heavy duty. And we don't know what the cost of electricity is going to be. So from a business perspective, it's really hard to, to jump ahead and say, this is what the profit is, this is what the cost is, this is what your operating is going to be. We're fully committed uh, from an industry. We just, the uncertainty of what's, what is it going to cost us and how long into the future will be there is, is a challenge. And just so you know, we are working on a big study in the joint office on this and the future operating model and business models that we hope to be able to share with you in time. We have to get our heads around it ourselves. Uh, Henrik? Uh, thank you, you everybody Henrik? for the, yeah, I can hear you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to have this discussion. I'll, discussion. Keep, it I'll keep it short. And I do hear, I do very, hear a very loud echo, loud but, echo I'm but I'm going to try and talk through it. Uh, my name is Henrik, uh, my name is Henrik Holland. I'm with Prologis, I'm with Prologis and, I and I represent the industrial real estate industry. Estate um, industry. Um, I want to underline and align, and align the comments, the comments the that the previous speaker made with respect to uncertainty around business, around business models. Um, to, um, to summarize, there's really two things, key things that, that we, we as, an as an investor in, in EV charging, EV charging infrastructure, infrastructure uh, struggle, uh, struggle with. with. It's the, it's the availability, availability of energy from local, local utilities. utilities. The, grid is, the grid is quickly going to run out of capacity at the distribution, at the distribution level. level. Um, we, um, can we can self-generate. We have the technical ability, ability to do so, but in many but jurisdictions, in jurisdictions um, um, we are limited in our capacity as a private entity to self-generate self with solar or linear, or linear generation, generation uh, which, is uh, which is a challenge. Then secondly, then secondly customers, customers struggle, struggle with EV upfront, EV upfront costs, costs, but they also but they struggle also with total cost, total of, cost energy of energy delivered, delivered as, we're as we're seeing that the capacity, capacity charge tariffs, tariffs in place, demand charges, demand charges time, of time of use rates are not aligned, are not aligned with EV usage in the commercial, in the commercial space. space. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Henry. Definitely a real issue. Uh, state by state as well. So we have about 11 minutes with the secretary. I want to give you an opportunity to ask uh, a question or two. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, this this is exactly what I was wanting to hear. Is what you guys see as the biggest problems that we've got to knock down. So there's obviously a, a whole uh, pile of issues that I know you guys are, are grappling with. I was intrigued by the notion of doing some uh, sort of counter programming um, about uh, you know dispelling some of the myths. We have a we have a column on our website called the Malarkey Corner, which uh, <laughs> is attempting to push back on some of the nonsense, not just on EVs but on other clean energy things. But I'm wondering, you know, and you guys have such a great uh, program with respect to public information, etc. Um, I think that I, I would love to hear more from you all on the specific of what is the malarkey? You said fear is one, right? Fear because people are afraid of what? Driving an electric vehicle that it'll explode or because of fires? Or are they afraid of costing too much? What are they afraid? They have fear of, uh, the fear is that you can control their lives. Me meaning that there's a cyber that's component? That, or? Yes, you, meaning that, um, you know, you would be in control of providing the electricity to control the car. So this whole conversation around autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, there's this, you know, Completely. intentional disinformation around it. So that's why there needs to be greater clarity on it. So people feel like government at some point can push a button and say, you are you can no longer move or operate. Mm. So that's one of the reasons why it's there. I hadn't heard that. I hadn't heard that. 
That's, um, yeah, I think it's real. I think it's it's the cyber disinformation. It's the cyber yeah. piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of uh, scare tactics and fear out there that comes from places like Twitter or WhatsApp or Telegram. Yeah. Right. Which is really great at telling the wrong story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are there other pieces of... Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, okay. I, I think on this particular, so I'm in the truck, I represent the trucking industry for this group, and uh, uh, there's only about 2,500 medium and heavy electric trucks in operation. But it has really excited the trucking industry, particularly the drivers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have very close relationships with like 50 electric truck drivers, and they love these trucks. I mean, really. Because? They're quiet, they're comfortable. They're a big golf cart on, you know, hauling 80,000 pounds of freight. I mean, it, and it is a, I've been in the industry 35 years, it's bigger than I thought, and I thought it was going to be big. And so I think um, actually in medium and heavy trucks, we might actually see the opposite here as we start to get butts in seats and real experiences of these trucks. I mean, of those 50, probably five, five to eight of those 50 would be retired and done driving trucks. So I think our driver shortage will be helped with uh, with these electric trucks because um, um, <clears throat> people will want to drive them and people want to keep driving them as they get you know as they get older so I just wanted to respond to that particular point. Sure um, well first of all thank you for, for your leadership for having us today Laura Chase with um, the Intelligent Transportation Society of America ITS America so we represent um, the integration of technology into the system. On the malarkey front um, yeah. I will add that there is a a real conversation um, that happens among some groups who do think that, that electric vehicles are a way to track them and that there is an opportunity for the government to say uh, you have you have out, uh, out driven your carbon emissions for the day so you we're gonna make your car no longer run or right I mean these kinds of very misinformed fears but they're real to the people who hear them and, and believe them and I think there's an opportunity from our perspective I think there's a huge opportunity here we're talking about um, charging infrastructure and we're, we're talking about a lot of physical components of a system but there's a digital layer that we have the opportunity to really build out in a safe and secure way that includes the ability to transfer use um, and communicate data that includes very strong cyber security controls and that includes um, data privacy and I think those are elements that need to be addressed as we build the system out among all modes in order to gain public acceptance um, because those those fears are real just quickly I think it's also fear of just change and whether it's uh, going from a uh, regular braking systems to automated braking systems that we went through at General Motors and all the other industries or throttle control from the regular carburetor to the electronic needs. These changes have happened throughout the years and so I think just the, the fear of change. And so one of the ways to do it as we communicate is communicate with regular people. My mom, my kids, the school teacher, and I think the more you get that out, that regular people are okay with this, the better and easier it's going to be. You'll always get the naysayers. It's going to happen no matter what, but the counteractive of this, and I think as you look at countries and cities who are embracing these technologies and getting common people talking about their experiences, the better you'll be able to uh, counteract the issue of fear. Can I just jump in on that? Please. Because I think the one thing that I was thinking about when the uh, education point was first raised is the question about who educates, like what are the things mm -hmm. that it makes sense for us to be trying to ask the federal government mm -hmm. to be saying versus others because there's a trust factor that we're dealing with and I always feel like the closer you get to people, yeah. real people, like the, the, the better it is in terms of their having, having an, an impact. So maybe this is something that, I like your malarkey corner, I didn't know it existed, <laughs> but, but a malarkey co corner that somehow, you know, married with people where, where the trust exists, I think <coughs> part of that, I just love if people have thoughts on that, whether that, like it has to be us or, you know, whether you see the value in having others speak on the issue. Yeah, so as you're answering, if you could answer that too, uh, Mayor Johnson. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think we're winning hearts and minds when it comes to electric vehicle. 
adoption. I, mean, I, I think a lot of us have been using them for a long time. We've been evangelizing for a long time, and and uh, we're getting a lot of adaptation across the country. That, that to me, I think this is an we're, we're provide, trying to provide leadership here, uh, but we're in, at the same time we're running to a, the front of a parade that is doing pretty well right now, uh, and and uh, so. Uh, I'm not as concerned about winning people over intellectually on this as I am with some of the more practical concerns, which is cost. It, I think is it's still a huge barrier. I know that we're making progress on that, but it still is is pretty much that there's a class society attached to electric vehicles <coughs> that is we need to work on. And I know Secretary Buttigieg mentioned that in his comments. But the other thing that that I, I gives me pause is I. I the math still doesn't work. You know, we, we talked about the grid capacity, and, and if we're fast and furious trying to convert the whole country over to doing this, at the same time seeing that there's a brick wall ahead of us when it comes to grid capacity, particularly if, if, if with Secretary Granholm's challenge that we don't power clean vehicles with dirty energy, you know, there's a disconnect there. Uh, so that I'm, I'm, I'm an evangelist, but at the same time I'm, I'm wondering, am I doing you a favor by converting you? I'm going to go to two people who haven't spoken. Kofi. Uh, thanks, Gabe. Uh, one fear, because I heard you would like to hear some specific fears. One specific fear as a consumer who was wanting to purchase an EV for the first time was cost of ownership. How much does a battery cost to replace if I needed to? Which, because of the range anxiety that I already had, I was already thinking about that question. But would never get, could never find the answer. But you know, I took the plunge anyway. Uh, the other uh, fear—I don't know if it's a fear or maybe it's just an unknown—is we get this a lot of times. This might belong in the malarkey corner, or it might not. Is uh, the impact of the weight of the vehicles on pavement and bridges, and what's our response um, to folks naysayers at this moment about that? Great. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jung Lee with Ashto. We represent the state DOTs. Uh, just a real quick note, I will say that I got a text yesterday morning getting kids ready for school from the Ohio DOT director, Jack Marchbanks, <laughs> at like 7.30, right? He's so excited about the first EV charging infrastructure uh, deployment there west of Columbus. And just wanted to say that our members are so jazzed because he was disappointed when Hawaii got the first procurement in July, but now he's, you know, turned the corner. There, I would say from the practitioners at the state DOTs, there's a real question about the conflict between infrastructure funding. Uh, the Highway Trust Fund obviously gets 90% of its revenues from the motor fuel taxes and the transition to EVs and how that can be addressed, obviously, at the federal level, but really mirrors a lot at the state level as well. And so in figuring the big picture kind of outcomes that we're all looking for, I, I do think that your leadership is so very much appreciated. Um, I know we're bumping up against time, and um, I, I know the secretaries have to be somewhere, so I want to thank everybody, uh, well, all of these folks for coming and being here and sharing and listening. Um, and I think, you know, we heard a few really important things. One is that public perception is really very important, um, and that there's maybe more that we can be doing at the federal level. Uh, along with you all. Uh, we don't necessarily need to say all these things ourselves. Um, and that there are real concerns about the grid capacity. It sounds like to serve the DC fast charging, uh, you know, the bulk of the charging in this country will be level two uh, and less of a strain, but for the DC uh, fast charging. And that um, there is, and this ties to the communications part, there's some real myth busting in certain communities that needs to happen. And there's expertise needed in certain communities that may not uh, exist as well. And so we will, we've heard you on all of that as well as everything else that we've written it all down. Um, I know that we also have the opportunity at some point to see a real new electric vehicle that yeah. hasn't been shown. So maybe that's yeah. a good segue. We're going to lose the secretary shortly. So we'd like to take a group photo up here, mm -hmm. and then we're going to pass it to the Postmaster General to introduce uh, the vehicle that we have out on display. And we'll take a break after that uh, to go see the, uh, <laughs> the new U.S. Post. So come up, come up, come on up for the photo. Thank you. Okay. 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 Okay.
to see much of your body from if you're on the floor. Oh. <laughs> and the legs. You're being recorded. Uh, both live and with the really attractive call to public service, which means you get a picture like that. Oh, nice. <laughs> And you know, I think they say the camera adds 20 pounds in 20 years. I would agree. <laughs> 30 pounds? There you go. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so this, uh, as I mentioned at the top, is just an opportunity for us to kind of calibrate as a group on um, some of the understanding of what's happening in the government, but also the EV market broadly. Um, so we'll have four speakers today. Um, Shailen, Administrator Shailen Bott, is our uh, Federal Highway Administrator. Um, he's going to give an overview of the Federal Highway programs, um, the amazing work that we have going on uh, at DOT. And we have virtually presenting Michael Baraby, who's our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Sustainable Transportation and Fuels at the Department of Energy. He's going to give us a little bit of uh, information about what DOE is doing, um, kind of touching on the decarbonization blueprint work that we have going on interagency, but maybe focusing on filling in a, a, a few of the gaps um, that maybe the EV working group members don't know as much about here. Um, since we are an EV working group, um, we want to make sure that we are covering the full, the full gamut of electrification technologies and opportunities. Um, and then we will have Elizabeth Creer, who is Vice President of Electric Vehicle Practice at J.D. Power. She's going to give us uh, data heavy, all the information, all the numbers you need to know about the electrification market, how people are feeling about it these days. Um, so really excited to have her here as well. And then we will finish with Mike Roth, uh, who's the Executive Director of the North American Council for Freight Efficiency, um, where he'll kind of orient us in the medium and heavy duty market um, and what is happening uh, for NACFI. Um, so I will just go ahead and kick it over to Shailen. Um, we've got a, a handful of presentations with short Q&A afterwards. Um, we are pretty tight in this session, um, so I will probably only take a, a few questions if folks have it after presentations. There's always the opportunity to uh, uh, meet after uh, the end of this session, or we can make sure that you guys have contact information for any follow-up questions. Great. Any questions? All right, Shailen. Yeah. So I actually know quite a few of you in this room who worked with you over the years. Uh, so that's uh, it's always great uh, in these jobs to come back and work with people. Um, and for those who don't know me, I look forward to getting to know you. Uh, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law of $1.2 trillion, um, $350 billion of that comes through the Federal Highway Administration, $7.5 billion of the $350 is, you know, through the NEVI and CFI programs. And so, um, you know, I get to go around the country a lot and talk to people about how we, you know, make this work successfully. I have a T&I hearing tomorrow which will be just like this. <laughs> so the ground rules, just a couple of questions. And, uh, I'm sure it'll be very, uh, uh, you know, very, uh, a lot of bonhomie. Uh, so, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, but, uh, you, know, you know, we talked about the future of our transportation system, but you know, the secretaries, I think, do a great job of why we're doing this and reducing GHG um, and getting down. You know, it's interesting. I spoke at COP. 14 in Cancun, and at the time, transportation sector, I think, was the second mm -hmm. highest source of GHG. The power industry mm -hmm. was number one. Um, well, power has actually done a great job, and utilities have done a great job of, you know, um, 
uh, driving that down. And now transportation is the number one sector. But I, you know, for those of you who aren't truly transportation people, I think it's important to understand some history and some perspective before we talk about the future. If we just go to that one slide with the map, um, I, uh, I think uh, you know we have a federal highway system because um, then Colonel Eisenhower, I mean, he was lieutenant, he was lieutenant at the time, tried to go across America in like 1915, 1916, and uh, they were like, how do we get the an American military convoy across this country? And it took them weeks, and it was a disaster. And the map of roads would not have been that extensive. And then, you know, he went to Germany, um, you know, during World War II and saw their extensive Audubon system and said, we're going to build one of those. And so one of the questions that I'm sure I'm going to get tomorrow in the hearing is, why have you only built one charger uh, in two years? Well, it took us about 40 years to build the interstate system from the time the money was um, appropriated in the 1950s to full, what we consider to be full build out, right? I was just in Phoenix last week in the section of I-10 through the, it was only built um, you know, in the late 80s, finally completed. And so I think we do need some perspective as we're going out there and talking to people, why is this taking so long? I mean, in DC, things need to happen yesterday, but our sort of goal here at the Federal Highway Administration is, you know, Congress enacted the law, we have to set the rules by which states and cities and other localities are going to come and be successful in delivering this program, both on the tax side and on the CFI side. But I would also say, when I look at this map, these are our alternative fuel corridors. If you think back in history, if you, you know, in the 1940s or the 1950s wanted to drive across the country, getting a place to get gas would have been a challenge. You know, that's where AAA kind of came from, right? Like this idea of here's where you'll stop, here's where you'll get assistance. We wrote regulations in building the interstate system that you had to go every 50 miles and have a rest area. And that's why you see those beautiful rest areas that are out there. So, um, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. And so that's what we're doing now with the um, rules that we're enacting is to say, hey, uh, one of the great things about our interstate system, if you drive from New York to LA, all the signs are the same. You know, the roads are built to the same standard. Uh, the exits all look the same. There's rules around, you know, the curves and the super elevation of the curves. Because we have a national system, we want the same thing for the charging experience when people are driving across uh, the country. And one other piece of history, and this is about the history and about the future. So in 2018 or so, I went to uh, speak in Beijing as you know the president CEO of ITS America uh, at an event around the Beijing Auto Show, and there was a government official there. I, I don't remember exactly what uh, ministry or department uh, he was from, but he, in his speech, was very clear that China had identified the automotive sector and, in particular, the EV sector as a key target in their next five-year and ten-year plans as ones that they were going to dominate. And he kept directing his comments at me, and I think maybe it was a translation thing, because ITS America, I think he thought, it's America. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 I'm not America. I'm ITS America. Um, I think that was lost in translation. But they were really clear about this. And what I would say to this group is that, um, you know, America won the 20th century in no small part because of our infrastructure, right? And you, we know this because I, Time or World's Magazine's rated like, you know, our transportation system is one of like the key things of the 20th century that really, um, you know, innovated our uh, country and our, our, our economy. Um, and to the automotive manufacturing, right? Like America, uh, you know, I, I live uh, in Michigan now. It's, you know, it's, it's Michigan, right? It's the, uh, the motor state more longer the Motor City. But you know who else is now really excited about uh, automobile manufacturing? The governor in Alabama, very red state, but very excited about EV manufacturing there. Tennessee, um, Kansas, I was out there, and the governor out there was very excited about the battery manufacturing plant uh, that was going in there. Um, and so what I would say to this group is that you know the 21st century is still being written. And just because we won the 20th century on the backs of our infrastructure and our manufacturing is no guarantee that unless we are resolute 
in the way that we deploy these funds and the way that we go into battle for our economy globally, uh, that we emerge at the end of this century with people writing the story about how America stayed in that pole position. And so um, I appreciate all of the work that you're going to do. At the Federal Highway Administration, we're going to get the NEVI funds out. Uh, CFI is coming soon. The um, uh, uh, you know the reliability accelerator uh, for the charges that are out there, we're getting that money out. Um, but everybody is very focused right now on sort of like this short game and, and, and EVs have become politicized very quickly and just for some perspective you know the, the Ford F-150 was not mandated the Lightning was not mandated by President Biden it was actually developed mostly in the last administration and that's okay right and I remember President Trump wanting to convert the GM plant in Lordstown to electric vehicle manufacturing nobody thought that was a woke agenda at that time it just seemed to make good business sense so what I've tried to do in my role is to depoliticize things that come our, our way, it is good for America for us to be successful in EV deployment. It is good for America in red states and blue states for us to make EV vehicles. That's what the president cares about. That's what secretaries Buttigieg and Granholm care about. And I look forward to working with all of you from the federal highway perspective. And we have division offices in every state. The procurements are going to go uh, uh, through us. But, you know, um, there's a groundbreaking or ribbon cutting tomorrow in uh, Ohio uh, that uh, I know uh, Director Marchbanks noted. It is for the first one, but every journey starts with one step. And, you know, there are lots of states that are coming soon after CFI is going to roll out. And I think we're going to hit the president's goal of 500,000 charges well before the end of this decade. And, you know, at the end of the century, they'll talk about how successful we were, but it's thanks to the work of groups like this. So. I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions or suggestions on how the Federal Highway Administration can be a better partner. Oh, not okay. even. Yes. Well, I remember when you were at CDOT, so Colorado Navy. Oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, good to see you. But um, what I would say too, I think there's a lot of opportunity, and we've been seeing it, but room for further exploration. You know, the utilities and. Uh, F the Federal Highway Administration, the, the local departments of transportation. I think there's a lot of room to collaborate as we're thinking about capacity and planning. Um, so I want to say I know we've been doing that, but uh, really keep focus there uh, to, as we're thinking about the build out to be successful. Yeah, that's a great. So uh, for those who don't, I was a Secretary of Transportation in Delaware and in Colorado. And in Delaware, we actually put up chargers on I-95 and uh, uh, US-13 um, in the hopes that some stream Volt might come along in 2011 and need like a little light on at the end. Uh, in Colorado, we took our uh, Volkswagen settlement money and with, uh, Utah and with uh, Nevada to try to get like a corridor. It's the first time you're getting seven and a half billion dollars of federal money for this. But before we thought of it just as sort of like a transportation thing, we're using Reggie funds in uh, in Delaware. But now you need that close coordination, you know, with uh, the utilities, because it does do much good to have a charger if the electrons aren't there um, to charge those vehicles. So that's a, that's a great point. Dr. Crystal? Uh, hi, thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned standardization. Administrator Cardahan also mentioned standardization. Uh, as someone who runs a nationwide fleet at vehicles all over the country, uh, you know, we're very interested in uh, working uh, more closely with folks who are working on standardization. It will make it a lot um, easier for us as we are training drivers to use these vehicles, as we are trying to standardize uh, payments and <coughs> right, the whole, the whole uh, ecosystem there. And so um, anything, you know, I, I appreciate the work currently uh, that's being done and the NPRM that's up for comment, and uh, just anything we can do to support uh, moving forward with standards would be helpful. Yeah, and, and, and again, I get just a bit of perspective, right? Like when I remember as a kid, you could put leaded gasoline in or regular gasoline. There's bad things happen if you got mixed up, right? And you still get stories about people putting diesel into, right? We're just talking about electricity, right? It's just you, you can't make a bad choice here, but you do want to get to standardization. And look, I actually think what has been great is the investment that the federal government has made is driving 
you know, us towards the center. We'll update our regs as that, you know, migration uh, continues. But uh, I think it's a very positive story. Uh, thank you, Shalyn. Good to see you again. Um, uh, you covered just one of my questions or one of my points, the interoperability idea. It's critical, absolutely critical. I want to, though, think about the infrastructure work you're doing from the customer back. Um, I think it's, and I know we recognize this in the abstract, but it's really important that the stations are reliable and that standards are, and I'm using standards with a small s, not a capital S, um, that standards of reliability, usefulness, uh, cleanliness, well lit, well positioned, that's critical um, because that sends a signal not only that um, this is a place to charge the vehicle and it's likely going to work, um, it sends a signal about safety, but it also sends a signal about the fact that the technology is ready right now and it's here right now. Um, you know, you know that there's always, you know, sort of, there's always going to be some downtime, but that can't be the norm. And so I think, you know, as we start to build out this <coughs> public private collaboration, that we focus on how the customer is going to think about the infrastructure. <coughs> Infrastructure and make sure that we're doing that from a customer back. Yeah, I well, I, I just think that you know, there's not a lot of downtime that's allowed, uh, and we're going to be rigorous in monitoring uh, to make sure that we do have uh, the appropriate uptime. But um, you know, I uh, uh, I think about Ray Kroc, right, when he was rolling out McDonald's, and you know, we want there to be like an excellent experience for people, right? And that's a pretty successful. Uh, American story, and, and I, I, I feel like we're going to be very um, aware. The president uh, is it, right now. We're talking about the quantity of the charges because you know we're just rolling them out there, but the quality will quickly follow up. Did you want to? Actually, I think the Red Rock example is because they focus on simplicity, right? And Speedy that's system. What, yeah, and that's what we try to do with the minimum standards. You know, we work day in day out, joint office, federal highways and try to make it, I don't want to say simple stupid, but you know, not over complicated so that the um, EVS E's had to put things on their charging systems that maybe would make the breakdown like three modems or big screens, right? Um, and there's something else I was going to say. Oh, uh, the ChargeX consortium that we stood up last summer uh, focused on the existing experience 24 month term improving dramatically. We just put out the um, uh, error document. So, like getting all the EVSEs to use the same error codes sounds sort of boring, but man, is that important? Or figuring out the payment systems and the back end on that. So, I think having 75 companies at the table, there's like a ton of learnings that are happening with three national labs, and then that's going to really impact the whole NETI system that's rolling out because, yes, we're going to improve the existing system, but also those learnings are going to go into the new system. That's great. Laura, are you good? I'm good. Uh, we'll close out with Doug. Thanks. Um, I don't know enough to, about Federal Highway's role in this idea, but the idea of transparency and pricing. Um, obviously, you have a lot of control along the corridors and NETI money and but with respect to the other public charging <coughs> systems, you can have all the number of apps in the world, but they don't seem to do a very good job on telling the consumer what the price of the electricity is going to be before they get there. And um, I don't know if on the gasoline side, if the local weights and measures folks, which have play a role in reliability, certainly with respect to pumps, Whoever, there must be somebody that can take charge of this transparency on pricing so that when you get to uh, the EBS and you know what you're going to be paying for and how much it's going to cost. Yeah, that, that is a great point because I, uh, I grew up with a father who would drive a long way to save just a few cents uh, on a liter at that time of, uh, of, of gas. And now I'm a father who, like, zealously plugs in my very sexy Pacific hybrid. Um, but I don't really know what I'm what I'm what I'm paying. And that is a 
a key point for consumers. So we'll kind of take that feedback and we'll work with the joint office to, to try to get that. Yeah, so actually one of the critical elements of the minimum standards was to at least kind of a, a foundation of transparent pricing. So um, while we haven't, we don't have the operational stations yet, a joint office and the Federal Highway Administration are working together on uh, a platform, a data platform, to collect a lot of these data um, and make sure that uh, transparent pricing is available at the charging stations as well. So there's a lot of data elements to the minimum standards that are really important for kind of the convenient and reliability aspects of charging, making sure that uh, we are focusing on the consumer. Yeah, and, and so um, I, I'll wrap here. I just yeah. I, I want to note uh, Jung's comment about um, Ohio being excited uh, to, to get out there first, but I think if you look at that map and those AFCs, like in a year, in two years, like those lines are going to get more solidified. And um, I just think what we're going to transition to is not wanting to be the state on the map that hasn't. Because it's pretty clear if you look at the, and again, get out of the, you know, just the sort of American red state, blue state uh, battle that we have. Like, EVs are clearly the way of the future, the way people are going. And I don't think any state's going to want to be like the one that, well, you you can't drive your EV here. So I, I think we're going to have a very positive story. I want to thank all of you for all of your work. And if you have any um, ideas or questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. We will yeah. transition now to Michael, uh, who will be giving his presentation virtually. Good to see you. Thank you. Hello. Great to see you. I think we have the uh, echo fix, which is wonderful. Let's see. Uh, I want to make sure you guys uh, that I can see. Do you have slides up? We're working on it. All right. And I can't quite see the screen. I could have been ago. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, well, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I had a chance to introduce myself, I think, in the first meeting. But uh, for those, and I know many of you in the room, for those who that I, I don't know, uh, Michael Barabi, I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the US Department of Energy, responsible for the sustainable transportation and fuels work. Uh, that includes uh, helping to co-lead the uh, joint office with my colleagues at, at US DOT, all things uh, batteries and light and heavy duty, but, but more than that. So um, Rachel and Gabe asked me to spend a few minutes just talking about the broader transportation decarbonization work um, that is across the agencies and then how that plays into where we are here on the, the on-road uh, pieces we're talking about on EVs. If you want to go forward a slide. Hey, Michael, um, is there any way you could get a little bit closer to your microphone and just fade it a little bit? You've alerted the IT support to also turn up the volume of the room. Ah, interesting. My microphone in the past has been quite good. Hold on one second. <coughs> okay. I'll turn up the volume of the room. That's Great. good. We're good. Okay. Thank you. All right, perfect. Uh, let's see, can you guys go forward a slide? All right. So it almost um, seems, goes without saying these days that government is coordinating across agencies, but I, I want to emphasize this. Back in September of 22, Secretary Buttigieg and Granholm, as well as Administrator Regan uh, and Secretary Fudge from HUD, signed an MOU and directed their agencies to begin working immediately in a coordinated way to align an overall government and private sector and stakeholder transportation decarbonization blueprint. And that, as that graphic on the bottom shows, you know, four agencies, we all know each other, we work together, but the goal was to make sure that we were all moving smoothly and seamlessly together. Uh, this is a knock on government many times that you know, they're not coordinated. And one of our goals was to uh, break that myth and to show we were coordinated and act, uh, act in one way so we could act quicker and faster and draw upon the power of all the agencies. Hopefully all of you have been seeing that live uh, and firsthand. You go forward, next slide. That led to, in January of this year, we rolled out the first 
U.S. Transportation Decarbonization Blueprint, a detailed plan that laid out pathways to get to net zero across all modes of transportation. And importantly, uh, and the reason I show this, this picture is it was not just government, but government, industry, stakeholders coming together. In fact, it might be one or two of you in the room that were in that picture below there. Uh, this was done at TRB. What I wanna do is give you guys a quick update of what's been happening in the last uh, 10, 11 months since, since then. Next slide. So the overall plan that we laid out at that time clearly laid out a goal that it must have complete decarbonization of the full transportation sector. And, you know, Shaylin talked about, you know, every action starts with one step. This was a first step, but important because it wasn't that long ago that people said transportation was too difficult to decarbonize. We couldn't get there. The technology wasn't there. It'd be too costly. And I think we have shown and are continuing to show that we can get there and actions are actually happening now across every single mode of transportation. You know, today and in this working group, we're talking really about the on-road sector, but it's important to note this work is covering the off-road sector, rail, maritime, aviation, uh, and, and pipelines, which are part of the transportation uh, system. If you can uh, click forward. To click forward a few times so that we'll pop the whole, whole page. So one of the key things that we have said at the very beginning is that hope is not a plan. We can't just hope we're going to get there. If we're going to achieve this and achieve it in the time frame needed, we need to have specific plans. So we set out, as I mentioned, to cover every mode, but to set up realistic and achievable pathways based upon solid innovation and science. We knew we'd have to be strategic, which includes in some cases making choices. Working on everything all the time is not gonna be a way that will get us to the end point. Now that's obviously a very delicate position because you don't wanna make the wrong choices too early, but also making no choices of where to prioritize funds or R&D or deployment won't get us to where we need to be. Third key tenant in the plan was we said, if we're gonna get to net zero, we need to leverage market force forces in order to have the wide scale deployments and cost effective clean transportation technologies. That's to say, we can't just regulate our way there. We can't just use policies alone. Those will be critical parts, but if we truly wanna to get to net zero, given the scale of impact, we have to have things that actually have cost effective solutions and again, can leverage market forces to accelerate the deployment. And we have to focus on solutions that can be incrementally deployed, that can deliver results now and clear and significant results by 2030. So that leads some solutions to not be as favorable as others if they take too long to get there or can't be incrementally deployed and require too many actors all at the same time to be acting or everything to be effective at once. We go forward. And we have to uh, address full life cycle emissions in everything we do, as well as integration of the grid. That came up a number of times earlier today as a, one of the most important aspects people on the committee mentioned, and we fully, fully agree. You go to the next slide. So just to give you one uh, quick snapshot of the, the document for those that have not had a chance to look at it, the we went through, and if you look at this, uh, focusing on each, each row, we looked at every single mode, as I mentioned, light duty, medium short haul, medium and short haul heavy duty, long haul heavy duty, down through pipelines. And we looked at what would be the technologies that had the potential to get us to the endpoint in the time frame needed. And while there's a mix of technologies from battery electric to hydrogen and sustainable liquid fuels, not all technologies, when you look at the marketplace, the cost and the timing have equal opportunity. And that's what we really laid out in this pathway. In short, for light duty vehicles, as I think everyone in this room fully appreciate and understand, battery electric vehicles really are the pathway. In the case of medium and heavy duty vehicles, it's a mix of battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. You go forward to the next slide. So what's our plan? I mentioned that, you know, we need to have specific plans to get there. Core to the plan was the investments that are being unlocked in the Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, someone mentioned it earlier. I think John probably mentioned over $125 billion in EV 
uh, and batteries by the private sector. Additional amounts when you consider the EV charging have been already announced and planned. That's being driven by a number of those uh, investments and tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. Over $100 billion in transportation decarbonization focused federal investments, uh, in particular ones that you know, focus on EV charging, but also on ports, which will include a lot of electrification, just as an example of one other area we may not always think about. You go forward to the next slide. So this is, uh, I think, the reference of what is, just as one example, U.S. battery investment. Now, this chart looked dramatically different two years ago. But currently, when you look at battery cell capacity in North America, there's over 1,200 gigawatt hours that have now been announced and planned. I, there is, for reference there, showed what's in Europe that's on par within Europe. Um, it is not as much as what is in the uh, PRC, People's Republic of China, for example, although it'll be interesting to see how that develops in there. The map on the right, I think, gets to the point that Shaylin was mentioning that this is not just a Michigan uh, or Midwest uh, type of investment. It is truly across the country and in many, many places. For comparison, um, if you look up at the top right, list how much we would need, for example, to get to 50% of light duty vehicles. 30% of medium and heavy duty vehicles to be electrified, we need it on the order of 840 gigawatts. So the current out to 2030 capacity exceeds what we would need um, by, by a little bit um, out by 2030. And of course, it would need to continue to grow um, out as you get towards 20, 2035. But we think this is really critical. The next three or four years will be the defining point. We're already hitting close to 10%, uh, just about 10% on monthly market share for EVs. So we're at that tipping point right now and just entering into it. Go forward to the next slide. I, I won't read all these. This is the point. Each one of these bullets is a separate and distinct EV tax credit covering vehicles, bioenergy, or hydrogen. And there are many. And these are fundamentally game changing items. When people talk about how will we get there, um, part of this is over the next four or five years, while we are driving down the cost through both scale and new technology, these tax credits will be critically important to fill that gap, whether it be for EV charging, for batteries, for vehicle production, for investment, for hydrogen production, uh, and we could go on. Go to the next slide. So what things keep me up at night, right? What are the things that we uh, believe we need to focus on? You know, the first two costs that was mentioned before, we need to continue to drive down battery cost and hydrogen cost. We are going full bore on that from a uh, technology and innovation perspective here at the Department of Energy. Certainly industry is doing significant amounts to ramp up the volume and uh, that will also help drive that down. We have not missed our battery cost targets now in uh, the 10, 15 years we have been setting them. So I think, um, I think we feel pretty bullish that we will get there. And importantly, those batteries we are working on are new chemistries. They have much lower critical minerals, which also helps reduce costs, but also helps broaden the number of battery technologies available in the market and address some of the supply chain issues. The bottom three are ones that I think this working group in particular will be wanting to address based on everything you've said. Grid integration absolutely has to be part of what, what we do, if we do not get grid integration right, we will require far more investment, which means far more cost, which means we won't hit the operating cost savings for businesses or individuals that we need for EVs. So grid integration, meaning smart charge management, um, the type of policy and, and rate design things that several people have mentioned are, are critical. Supply chain and fundamental resource availability uh, the fourth item, there is a lot happening right now with the different tax policies that are helping to drive dramatic diversification of the critical mineral supply chain needed for batteries. The battery supply chain in two or three years from now will look dramatically, dramatically different than it does today. There's a lot of commitments being made through the supply chain now to diversify and grow that globally. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done there, and that is also a, a key priority for us. And then the last one, the infrastructure uh, gaps, EV and H2, whether it be the building the physical infrastructure, making it truly customer friendly and interoperable, and the customer awareness of that infrastructure are, are the other key gaps. So those are the things that we really see and recognize. Maybe just for the last slide here, 
So what are we doing over the next year? What are our next steps looking forward? We are now in the process of developing mode specific detailed decarbonization plans uh, in collaboration with industry and stakeholders. This FACA is a critical source of input for medium heavy duty and light duty vehicles. We actually just uh, yesterday had a uh, kicked off a two day maritime stakeholder meeting. Uh, so it's happening with, with each sector. Uh, and we will over the next six months be releasing those more detailed mode specific plans to really help guide not just what government, but all stakeholders collectively need to do to help hit our goals. A key part of that is developing the metrics and uh, maybe if you will, milestones or key performance indicators, however you want to think about it, that help all of us look at, are we on track? Are we on track to hit where we need to be, when we need to be? Um, and it's not to point a finger to say, hey, you're not on track, you're not on track, but so that we collectively, and I love that that was part of the secretary's charge, the statement to work collectively so that we can all say, look, we're falling down collectively on this area. What can we all do together to get there? Um, we'll certainly be aligning uh, our agency actions across bill and IRA investments, doing a lot of work to make sure those are coordinated, the technical R&D works I mentioned, uh, stakeholder engagement, and, you know, and ultimately really making sure that we have scalable, affordable, practical, and equitable solutions. So making sure across all four of those areas, when we look at pathways and solutions that are being developed uh, and that we're incentivized or implementing that all of those are hit. So that's what I really wanted to share. And I think, uh, Rachel, um, you wanted to have a few minutes for question and answer. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. I think we have time for maybe one question. You repressed us all, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for joining virtually and for the presentation. Um, and we will invite Elizabeth Pira. <coughs> Okay, so good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to provide you with our latest customer EV data. Um, I'm going to also try to um, show you some trends. You know, how has the customer been behaving and where are we heading? And then finally, also share with you uh, some of the top barriers from the customer's point of view, as well as some opportunities. So next slide, please. Uh, let's begin with the customer. So we survey over 2,000 new vehicle shoppers every single month, and we are gauging their interest in EVs. During the past two years, customers who tell us they are very likely to purchase an EV for their next vehicle purchase has grown uh, 10 percentage points. So it has grown from 20% in 21 to 29% um, is where it sits today. So that's one out of, um, sorry, three out of every 10 vehicles are very interested in purchasing an EV. But part and parcel is who's saying they're very unlikely to purchase an EV, and that's on the next slide. Uh, what we see here is that uh, very steady trend here. Two years ago, 21% said we will not, we will not consider it and now 19%. So that has actually degraded a little bit. But everybody else is in the middle. So which way are, are they going to turn? Uh, so it, it comes down to, let's look at the trends of, of these vehicle shoppers who are very likely, how many are actually purchasing? And that's the next slide. Uh, what we see here, is of those 30% who are very likely, one in three actually purchases. Uh, Michael said it. The uh, monthly retail share reached an all-time high in October at 9%, and it has held steady for the last two months. It's currently at 8.9%. But uh, one thing that I do want to point out, even though one out of every 10 vehicles sold is an EV, what I want to point out is that the majority of these vehicles are in the premium segment. 
So the mainstream market EV share is only at 2.6%. The rest is premium. So what <coughs> does this mean for the future of EVs? Uh, next slide, please. Here we are looking at the national view of our forecast. And I want to just pause a little bit to talk about this forecast and how we, how we calculate it. First off, it is a bottoms up forecast and we update it twice a year. Uh, there's enough dynamics changing in the system that we, we do see, you know, it changes very slow and we don't see dramatic changes um, as we update it, but we do, do see some changes. What are we looking at? We are looking at trends within vehicle segments. Who's buying what segments and where are they buying them in the ICE world? And how is that trend translating to the EV world? We're looking at all of the state differences and it's dramatically different from state to state. The incentives are different. The infrastructure is different. We have an index for infrastructure at the zip code level. We can tell you at the zip code level who has the highest propensity to buy and, and how is the infrastructure relative to supply and demand, relative to location, relative to speed of charging, relative to how many people have homes versus uh, multi-unit dwellings. So this forecast is a very um, intensive bottoms up forecast. And um, nationally, we, we have the score by state, but na and we also have it by segment, but nationally, we are sitting at 9% retail share as forecasted. By the end of next year, we project that we will be at 13%. Um, and at 9%, we're still in that early adopter phase. At 13% is where we will start to see the early majority. So by the end of next year is where we're going to start to see that early majority. And that's when we're going to work towards that 50% um, that by 2030. So uh, next slide, please. Naturally, this varies from state to state. And this is a heat map of adoption in the country today. This is today's adoption scores. In California, roughly one out of every two shoppers um, that has a viable EV option to ICE is confirmed that they are purchasing. So again, an example of how California is behaving at this 50% adoption rate already. Um, uh, there was, uh, Shailen had talked a bit about this isn't a red state, blue state uh, thing. This isn't a SEV state, non-SEV state. And, and we're, we're seeing that as well. When we look at this heat map, you know, half of the top 10 adoption states um, are, um, are red, red states, half are blue, half are SEV states, half are not. Uh, we also see states that offer incentives to be more heavily adoptive states, and then also states with higher infrastructure scores. So in a nutshell, adoption is higher in states that do have uh, uh, invested in, in, in infrastructure as well as incentives. Uh, next slide. So why have some of the automakers announced plans to scale back on EVs? EV share of inventory has grown from 1% a year ago to 6% today. But a year ago, new vehicle shoppers struggled to find an EV on dealer lots and they were paying a premium. So having some level of inventory has helped EV adoption. Uh, but at, at 6%, uh, it's still less than the EV retail share of 9%. But please keep in mind, you know, to our dealer advocate friends, um, that this does not include direct-to-consumer. So it does not include Tesla. And now I'd like to shift gears and talk a bit about some of the barriers to adoption. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the top 10 reasons um, 
why consumers, <coughs> vehicle shoppers, tell us that they're not, you know, that they're not ready to adopt. And on the next slide, uh, you can see that two two of the ten have to do with purchase price and cost of ownership, or what we call affordability. So on the next slide, I know this is um, not new to most everybody in this room. We talked about it a little bit, but here it is all on, on one page. While the overall price of an EV is generally higher than that of an ICE in this what we call legacy view, there are significant federal, state, and local incentives that influence or offset that price. Additionally, the operating costs, gasoline, um, is, is more expensive than electricity. Maintenance, maintenance is also less on an EV. And we do have some repair analytics data. And what we're seeing is that maintenance for an, for an EV compared to ICE is about 55%. So the consumer will save about 45% of maintenance costs. Furthermore, utility companies, they off, often offer incentives for uh, charger installations, time of use charging, and finally residual values. Um, we, JD Power also owns ALG, and uh, we do assess the residual values of electric vehicles on an ongoing basis. To date, we're seeing that the electric vehicles are holding their residual value. Um, there are some things that will, will come into play, you know, as Michael mentioned, uh, new battery technologies. You know, so do so do vehicles become you know, obsolete? The you know the Chevy Bolt example is a very different kind of battery than, than where we're heading in the future. Um, there's also variables of, of, of consumers lowering pricer, prices. Tesla a year ago, if you bought one, you paid twenty thousand dollars more than now. So that's going to affect residual. So we are constantly looking at, at residual values. There's some things that are going to boost it up, and then and then some things that will push it down. So I don't think it's going to change too much um, in the near-term future because we've got these uh, composing initiatives. Um, but this is very confusing to the customer. A few of you said it. It's confusing, and there is an education component. And, um, you know, it is left now on the hands of, number one, the consumer. And because we're an early adapter phase, Consumers are, are tend to be more innovative. Uh, they educate themselves. But as we get into the early majority, um, there's going to be a need uh, to, to be able to educate the, 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 the customer and, and not leave that all up to the hands of, of the dealer. So next slide. So when we look at affordability this way, EVs have achieved price parity with ICE. Here on the chart, a score of 100, of 100, equals price parity with ICE. Tremendous progress made this year with this inclining uh, affordability score. What drove affordability this year? Well, it's the 7,500 uh, federal tax incentive. And there's that uh, lease. You can see on the bottom, the bars show the lease mix. Leasing has really increased this year. Why? Because there is that pass-through of the credit for a lot of vehicles that wouldn't otherwise qualify or individuals that wouldn't otherwise qualify. It took a few months for the OEMs to get their ducks in a row to be able to opt to pass that through to the consumer. And then it also took a couple of months for the consumer to uh, understand what that meant to them. We also saw, uh, as I mentioned, significant price reductions from Tesla, Chevrolet uh, on, their, on their Bolt and Bolt EUV, Ford on the Mach-E. So a lot of uh, prices did come down this year. And we saw changes in the, in the price class mix. And this is important. When the F-150 launched, the Lightning, it launched very rich. It, with the average transaction price was about $82,000. But now, the average transaction price is about $68,000. It's not because Ford necessarily took the pricing down, uh, $12,000. It's because they started to offer price classes that are in, the, in, the, in, a, in a bit of a lower range. So we do, even though we're at parity today, uh, can't get too comfortable because affordability is one of those things that is constantly changing. Uh, we expect some volatility. 
um, especially as te Tesla refreshes their vehicles. Are they going to come in and back at their old pricing, or are they going to stick to their new lower pricing? Uh, same thing with a lot of the market that is not covered today. Uh, the the midsize SUV market, very large segment. Um, Full-size pickup trucks, not a lot of competition, and, and truck owners are typically loyal to their brands. As these mainstream vehicles hit the market, uh, will they be coming in at, 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 a, at a price that's more comparable to ICE? These tend to be very expensive vehicles to begin with, so we do see affordability changing. Uh, next slide. This the, Another... Um, Top four, these, all these pink squares have to do with infrastructure. The biggest barrier to adoption, it's been talked about today quite a bit, is infrastructure. Uh, four out of the top ten reasons. So, on the next slide. When we talk about EV owners, you know, that last slide was barriers to adoption shoppers. This is EV owners. These are our, our uh, consumers that own an EV. And the highest level of satisfaction for an EV owner is charging at home. They love waking up to a full charge every morning. It's, 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 it's a wonderful thing. But lack of public charging on the other end of the spectrum, there's a whole bunch of other satisfaction items in between, lack of public charging is the lowest satisfaction among EV owners. A 350 point spread. Next slide, please. But not all EV owners have the ability to charge at home. Uh, currently, again, we're early adopter phase, 87% have single family homes. And of those that do have single family homes, 90% of those owners charge at home. But many owners, um, that seven, uh, sorry, 13%, that live in multi-unit dwellings, uh, they have to charge in public. And this is where we need to have a balanced approach between level two charging in the workplace or during dwell times and at the public charging, fast charging stations. And one of the reasons why on this chart, you can see it off to the right, why, why um, charging at work is so low compared to charging at a, at a public station is because it's not readily available. Next slide, please. So going back to those shoppers, um, shoppers, the two bars to the right, shoppers who do have access to charging, sorry, that do not have access to charging at home, um, but do have access to charging at work are 48% more likely to consider purchasing an EV than those who don't have access at home and don't have access at work. So this is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Unfortunately, again, this has been the sentiment in the room. We've, we've talked a lot about it, talked a lot about the initiatives that are, are happening. But unfortunately, um, even with all of the investment in infrastructure, our infrastructure uh, is growth is, is still falling behind. So we say, you know, how can this be? We're investing billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure. How come that infrastructure score isn't improving? Well, it's because uh, EV Park is growing at two and a half times the pace of EV charger growth. I do want to say, uh, what was it? In August, I presented this slide at uh, CAR, MBS. And that difference was three times. So that's an indication that there's some progress. In August, it was EV Park was growing three times, and now it's two and a half. So I think all these initiatives getting up to the 500 is going to have a tremendous effect here. Um, but what's going to be critical is the reliability, reliability of the fast charging. And unfortunately, we have not seen. We are fielding. We have not seen an improvement in reliability. One out of every five charging attempts is a failure. And I do want to point out that we are fielding public charging feedback from consumers all year round. We get the seasonal effect. We get the new charger effect. We, you know, so, um, but we're not, seeing, we're not seeing an improvement yet. 
Um, if you break out Tesla, Tesla's at 96% reliability. So they they have with their own cars. With the, with their own cars, exactly. So really anxious to see you know next year when when we start to see more people leveraging that network, um, how that's all going to work. Uh, we are we are tracking it. We will continue to report it. Uh, so in summary. Next slide, there, there, there's a lot of interdependencies and variables that we need to keep a constant pulse on uh, that can all affect EV adoption and, and, and this forecast model. However, as momentum builds, it sticks. And 95%, I'm sorry, 91, it was, it was 90 last year, 91% of EV owners say they are very likely to consider buying an EV again. Any questions? Yes, I think we have time for um, maybe one or two questions. Kofi, you want to go first? Just a quick question on the, I guess that was survey data that you got where the folks were saying where you could calculate the percentage of folks that charge at home. Yes, we, so we, asked them, we asked them the frequency of where they charge. So we know the frequency of where they charge um, at home, the frequency of when they charge in public, and then the frequency of when they charge at work. And then we stratify that data based on are they single unit um, homeowners or multi-unit dwellings. That was all. Well, I have another question, but not for you. It was for the utility industry. Because trying to figure out like exactly how many chargers, for example, are in single family households or multi-family dwellings would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. That would be great. But I, I know the, the challenges. Uh, for that. So I'm going to try really hard to end us on time, um, which means we should probably go to Mike. However, I will note um, both, uh, so Michael is actually a member of the working group. So if you have questions for Michael, you can always get a hold of him. Elizabeth is not a member, so if you have questions for her, I would encourage you to try to get your questions to her by the end of the day. Yeah. All right, Mike. Hi, um, so Rachel called me Friday and said, can you get an update? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I said, hell yeah, because I, we've got some, some great, very, um, it's, it's timely that we're starting this um, with some work that nacv has been doing. So uh, uh, what I'm going to explain or show is the kind of the state of electric trucking in North America um, get through the eyes of what we call run on less electric depot. So next, next. Slide. It's at runonless.com is where you can see all of this in our organization, snacky.org. Um, but uh, runonless.com, if, if anything I say or you get excited about something, go there. Uh, yes, yeah, so Run On Less is an effort. So we're 13 years old. Uh, in 2017, over every other year, in the odd years, we do something called Run On Less that we, we, we think is like the best of the best in trucking. So it started with diesel long haul trucks, we did regional haul, and now we've done two on battery electric trucks. The first one in 21 was 13 different fleets all across the country, and it, they could participate in this run if they had only one electric truck. So there we were kind of like, are these real? I mean, I was calling them, uh, you know, Sasquatches, uh, mm -hmm. Bigfoots, you know, that you hear about electric trucks, but they're really not there. But so in 21, we kind of confirmed that they are real. And these are, and what we do at the run is it's real trucks, real routes, real freight, real drivers. This isn't like engineering, um, you know, demonstrations or anything like this. This is real boots on the ground. That that picture, the third from the right, or the third from the left, is DHL in Manhattan with an electric delivery van, for instance, and they had, um, uh, you know, a small class three kind of vehicle. But what I really want to talk about is what we've done here in 2023. So next, so. In electric truck market segmentation, uh, before I get into that, we, we sort of look at moving goods, and there's more commercial trucks than just moving goods. Think about garbage trucks and snow plows, but forget about those for a minute, just look at goods movement. We think it's helpful to think about it this way, that small trucks, vans and step vans moving freight, the ones that are bringing you your packages for Christmas, uh, medium duty box trucks that have a little longer range, more capacity, I'll jump to the bottom, which is what most people think about around class eight heavy duty trucks, and that's the, the old Smokey and the Bandit long haul, uh, disparate routes, 
Truckers are um, sleeping at truck stops. They don't know where they're going to be tomorrow. That's a that's a part of heavy duty trucking, but not all of it. And there's a group ahead of that or above that, what we call re regional haul return to base. That is a very modest part of the market that really isn't talked about a lot. Rakesh mentioned a couple of segments uh, that are electrifying today earlier, and that would be things like food and beverage and drayage and this sort of that short and medium. They go out, but they sit at stores and they, they go in and they do their deliveries. They come back out. They maybe do 100 miles or less a day. So we define short as 100 miles or less, medium 300 miles or less. Long return to base is where that truck goes a long way out. Maybe uh, prop and hook the trailer, maybe deliver some freight and come all the way back. So that's um, you know, maybe 600 miles, which is particularly challenging for EVs as we have them right now. Next. Um, so with run on less electric depot here in 23, we're not even looking at long haul disparate routes yet. There are no sleeper tractor electric vehicles yet. Um, there are some day cab uh, return to base generally operated trucks that are doing some long distances. And so I want to get into now what we found with depot. So next. Uh, yeah, and I just basically said that, um, that there's a, a bit of a movement from long haul disparate routes to more hub and spoke return to base. This is good for trucking. It gets drivers home every night instead of sleeping in truck stops. And it also en enables some of the uh, electrification because that, that truck's now coming back to its base. Uh, and, and for trucks that come back to their base, you can then put, it's just like charging at home. We're charging at a truck depot. Next. So the 10 facilities, the 10 depots, the 10 fleets that we were able to get together and do this this year are shown here. Um, eight of them are in California. So, um, you know, spoiler alert, that's where a lot of this is happening. Um, also, earlier I said something like 2,500 heavy duty tractors registered in the U.S. That's a guess on our part, um, but we do know at the end of last year, that was about half of that um, and uh, like 1,200, mostly uh, yard tractors. These are tractors that stay on property at warehouses and moving trailers around. Um, and so an e a really easy, short, heavy duty uh, return to base operation, they don't even leave the base. Uh, and, uh, but California is where a lot of this is happening. So what I wanna do now is show a video, go ahead and get it started. And I want to narrate through like a journey across all these 10 to kind of give you some, some sites. Cash and I were at, at one of the sites together. And Patrick, who was in, here with us earlier, he was at another one. But um, yeah, here we go. About six minutes. Cross your fingers. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so we had 10 sites. At those 10 sites, they operate about 850 trucks, of which right now 291 are electric. Um, that's a big portion of the, of the, current, of the current market. Um, and so we went out and visited all of them. We interviewed um, truck drivers. We interviewed um, the people maintaining the trucks, operating the trucks, who bought the trucks. We uh, talked to utility operators who were working to deliver the power to them. Um, across all of these all of these 10 sites and um, 122 on-camera interviews to create a bunch of videos including this one we're not quite watching yet <laughs> um, but what uh, what we uh, let me jump to the conclusions of, uh, of, of where what we learned in all this and that is that uh, depot sites that we call small energy depots so these are sites with just a few trucks or maybe small trucks that are going short distances. So um, one of the depots is uh, a Frito-Lay location in Queens. So some of these trucks only go five to 10 miles a day and delivering chips and, and so forth. Some of them go 20 or 25 miles, but 67 e-transit delivery vans um, going small distances, you know, it wasn't that difficult for Con Edison to get them the power to be able to charge those trucks. On the other end of the spectrum are a couple of, of depots, one that Rakesh knows really well. It's actually that site right there in uh, South El Monte where they've now deployed 92, yeah, yeah, 92 battery electric e Cascadias doing drayage. So they're moving containers to rail yards and to warehouses around Southern California. Here we go. So 10 fleets, 10 depots, 291 electric trucks. 
a lot of data we <coughs> I always call the run sort of right brain left brain we do all these interviews and that's sort of the left brain and then we put up a pretty detailed dashboard that is a, a bunch of detailed data that we found in uh, when we were out working with these with these companies so here's Pepsi this is in Sacramento this is a Tesla semi location we tracked three Tesla semis really uh, closely uh, and the drivers love these trucks, um, but it's not so much the Tesla, it's really the electrification, the electric truck and its powertrain. Here's Port of Long Beach with Watt EV. This is a, uh, what they're calling truck as a service that will ultimately be, be more of a, just a charging hub. But right now they're delivering freight out of it, actually with the Uber Freight. Uh, we saw our first one megawatt MCS charger there. Um, there's no trucks to charge with it, but they've got the charger and the plug. <laughs> Um, and that's one of the issues um, that, you know, a lot of these trucks today can only charge at like 180 or maybe 360. Um, and so here's OK Produce. This is one of, uh, if I have a favorite child in this, this is it. These guys are 110 electric trucks hauling fruit and vegetables out of Fresno. And they're leaning in fast. He's, you know, this Brady Matoya and the CEO. There's a yard truck right there. If you don't know what they are, they're uh, I don't, I think maybe by 2030 we won't even be building any diesel yard trucks. UPS, um, this is one where the environmental, or the emissions can have a real impact for them. They, they like a lot of uh, home delivery companies, those, those trucks go in and they get loaded inside the facility. So think about 200 of those trucks with diesel today or gasoline going inside to load every day. If they're, there they are, if they are now zero emission, what does that mean to the quality of life inside that sorting facility, um, and actually the expense. Um, we told a lot of stories during the run, so we, we highlighted each location, but we also told some stories. This is that Schneider Intermodal location with 92 um, trucks. Very interesting here. It used to be that uh, with the diesel trucks that Rakesh would run it in the morning, I would drive it in the, in the evening, two shift operation. These electric trucks don't have enough range to do that. So what they incorporated here is a next truck up model. And literally, when I heard Schneider was doing this, I'm like, bull only. There's no way they can continue operations without two or three times as many electric trucks. But essentially, they're doing it with 92 electric trucks with what they did with 80 or 82 diesels before because the, they can come back to that site and charge. Their, their radius of operation of those 92 trucks is pretty tight. So they can come back and charge during the day. Driver jumps out of one truck with a 10% state of charge, jumps into another one with like 100%. Here's Pure Later in Vancouver. They're going pretty fast on their delivery trucks. Um, again, uh, you might have saw the charger coming out of the ceiling. That was, uh, I thought, pretty innovative there where, um, you know, these trucks are big. So if a charger's in the front bumper or on the back, back of the trailer or back of the truck or whatever, I mean, it's a long cable to be, be working on. Um, when we talked about standards earlier, I think there's some work maybe to be done there. Some fleets like to back their trucks into parking. Some like to pull in. Some like to be on site. And, and here's Queens, New York that I mentioned a little bit earlier with the um, 67 E transits, but not a lot of miles um, to drive. Interesting here, um, they, they're going from no electric trucks to 100% in a, in a year. And um, they're, they, they had really old trucks, like these really dense urban places are where trucks tend to go to die. So, you know, you don't want to, you, you know, as an operator, you can, you can keep using that truck longer and longer if you put it in um, situations where it doesn't go far from base. If it breaks down, you go get it, you bring it back. It's not very far away. This one is Penske's site in Ontario, California, and Penske buys all kinds of trucks to lease to tons of companies, right? So the key at their sites is interoperability. So they need to be able to charge an eCascadia, a Volvo VNR, a eTransit, um, you know, at their sites or at their customer sites. Um, you know, inter interoperability um, is re really important to them. And then um, maybe lastly is Maersk performance trend, uh, performance team um, with uh, Volvo VNR tractors. Uh, here's another case where they are getting, I, I kind of call it, you know, they're doing the job of a big hammer with a small hammer, meaning they don't have the range they need, but they're routing their trucks around and getting them back um, to, uh, to base to charge, uh, even maybe over a long lunch hour. So, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, 
you can you can make these trucks work. Um, they make you may have to own more, you may have to you know, cost more, etc. Um, but uh, you know the, the, the industry is doing what we do, and that is deliver the goods that, that we need. Lastly, U.S. Foods and, and what a number of the other fleets had the same problems these folks have, and that is it just takes too long to get power to the sites. Um, even if you're just deploying 10 or 15 trucks, let alone 100, where you need you know, what a lot of these utilities are saying is a two-year engineering study and a seven years or five to seven years to, to get the power. So U.S. Foods, UPS, a couple of the others um, really had trucks coming and, and no way to charge them. So they put in temporary chargers here at this U.S. Foods location. Um, okay, Produce actually, uh, you know, found power on site that they didn't, you know, there were certain areas of the of the big warehouse that, that had some capacity that the other, the other places didn't. Um, and then I, we conclude this video with um, what I want to finish up with, and I kind of said it earlier around truck drivers. This is really engaging the industry. Um, the 122 interviews we did, um, I'm going to be blunt here, I mean, trucking industry has kind of been a, you know, an old white guy's business for a long time. Um, and the 122, 49% of the interviews we did were women or people of color. And um, the, the passion, commitment of the people working on this in the industry is uh, really impressive to me. And I think the whole industry, and it's hopeful, it's not a plan, but um, <laughs> you know, it gives me some more confidence. I want to conclude with a couple things real quick. We, uh, uh, I talked about the dashboard and sort of the right brain. We instrumented 22, yeah, 22 of the uh, 291 trucks and had a dashboard for 18 days in September. So, uh, yeah, if we can go back to the slides. Uh, we, I want to show you two trucks. Um, it'll be pretty small, but it might give you some, um, uh, some, in, some in, uh, it might give you some thoughts around, or some data around this idea of uh, opportunity charging, either coming back to base to charge or finding charging out on the road. Um, so the, the the dashboard is pretty detailed as you'd guess, but let's go to, I want to just show two real quick. So go to the next slide. So this is an e-transit at Penske. This was day two. Um, and that is a 68 kilowatt hour battery pack, but it did 184 miles. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did it do that? Um, and it was because if you look at that um, state of charge chart, the lower right one in the middle, the state of charge came down over time as the miles went up. But they went back to the site and got um, a long lunch, charged, got some charge back up, and was able to do more miles. This was all in pharmaceuticals around Ontario, California, and, and uh, 54 deliveries that day. And this was just a single shift. Um, now, if we go to the next one, and this is the, the thing that kind of broke our dashboard almost in the internet, was um, everybody wanted to know what the Tesla Semi could do. So. Um, here, and I don't have time to go into all the details, but um, it did do 410 miles on a single charge, um, fully loaded with beverages, and this truck uh, operated uh, all of the 24 hours. So we drink a lot of beverages in this country, so there's a lot of warehousing, and Pepsi has a lot of places to do this. So they, they had the warehouses open, they had drivers all day. This is their normal operation. But what it shows is what I call the art of the probable. So this is 750 kilowatt Tesla charging, the Tesla Semi. And so those recharge rates are really fast. Um, they, they charged um, you know, zero to 90% in uh, a little over an hour uh, and um, zero to 50% and they cut the truck loose to do another delivery um, in, in about 40 minutes. So uh, this is fast charging, this is like a, a, a potential view into the future of fast charging battery electric trucks. So um, 24 hours, 1,076 miles, um, making true real deliveries. So I'm going to stop there. I mean, I, the next couple of slides are some big findings that we had. Um, reach out to me or ask me. Um, but basically, uh, the three big findings we had is small energy depots are ready now. Large energy depots, you know, bigger trucks, more trucks, it is tough and it takes a long time to get the infrastructure. Um, and then our final one is just, in our view, um, as we look at the future of, uh, of, of electric trucking and, and what challenges do we have actions to mitigate and what challenges don't we? 
getting power to the sites from what we're talking, we're talking a lot, you know, can be, you know, we can be, be talking about a lot of demand uh, from the grid at these trucking depots or truck stops or, you know, corridor hubs um, a, as we move forward. So we see that as the biggest challenge um, from the work we've been doing. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Um, I am uh, going to press on um, since we don't have too much time, and I'm dedicated to starting and ending these meetings on time because I know all of you have day jobs <laughs> and oftentimes schedule things around around the timing of these um, and might need to do some wrap up work at the end of the day. So, um, big thank you to the presenters. also a member of the working group, so obviously if, if questions pop up, um, otherwise uh, Elizabeth is, is here, hopefully she can stay a couple yeah, can stay more minutes, minutes to answer any questions. A uh, few reminders um, that we are going to break it up into subcommittees tomorrow, so I sent around the subcommittee assignments, um, as, well, as well as the proposed framework for us to break into those subcommittees, so take a look at that. Um, I can also send the charge, now that the tar charge is, is known by the EV Working Group, I can send that around to folks a while just so that you can noodle on it overnight. Um, we will start at 9 a.m. tomorrow, but reminder that um, security uh, does still have to get through, so if you could arrive promptly like you did this morning, everyone did an awesome job not only getting here on time, but also coming back from the break on time. So uh, I applaud you all for that, and let's make it a, a twofer for tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much.